we're going to talk about compromise and manipulation and uh, why it's important to maintain good boundaries while in a prison environment. So compromise and manipulation at their very fundamental level is that I am somehow getting you to do stuff for me that I want you to do, right? So we all know that this happens in our own lives a lot. If you have children, probably more, uh, that they make that cute face at you and you buy them whatever they want, or maybe you have a spouse who is very good at charming you into whatever they want to do. So com that manipulation can be as easy as I want Chinese food, and so I'm going to convince you that Chinese food is the food that we should eat tonight, even though you want tacos. So that is kind of low-level manipulation. Is that at the, the base of what we're going to talk about today? Absolutely. So, but the outcomes of compromise and manipulation, though seemingly innocent at the beginning, uh, in a prison environment can be pretty detrimental. Um, so I want to talk about your responsibility. So as an advocate, as somebody who's coming into Department of Corrections uh, facilities and then also into jails, uh, what is your responsibility to that agency, to that hosting facility? So do you understand your position? Why are you going in? And then really having an understanding, and that's why we're doing this training, of the environment in which you're working. So some of the behaviors and maybe even what you wear, how you conduct yourself, might be a little different if you were in a community setting. Um, and maybe that's just not acceptable in this setting. And, and maybe we're not going to exchange things or um, I don't want you to know where my office is at that moment or, or those things. So just really giving some careful consideration to your own role, being fully aware that things aren't as straight, always as straightforward as they seem. So somebody may be giving you information or trying to gain your empathy and perhaps that there's an alternate uh, reason for that. And so some of the worst cases of compromise that I've ever seen started with questions like, do you like basketball? Well, what do you like about basketball? Do you go to the game? And they're looking for you to say something like, you know what, I can't really afford basketball tickets. Well, then that becomes, well, don't you hate your agency? They don't pay you enough and this. They paid you more. If they cared about how much you work and how valuable you were, like I do, then, and so that's kind of our cycle. That's what we're looking for is is that early on manipulation, can I get your pen from you? Can I get a piece of paper from you? Can I talk you into something? If prison staff are telling you you shouldn't bring in brochures and an inmate says, but I want one, and you bring it, we should be having some conversation around that. So just really thinking about um, that not being maybe as straightforward or even an offhand compliment. So are we then confronting that behavior? If I say to somebody in the room, you know, I really like your hair today. Is that an innocent compliment? Probably not. And so my answer in that situation, and your answer doesn't have to be what my answer is, but I like people to know that I've noticed that they are being a little bit inappropriate is, well, thank you very much for acknowledging my hair, but it's inappropriate that you made that comment. I appreciate you know, not make comments like that in the future. And so that really would be my encouragement for you that like, you know, I, I, it's very nice that you think I'm pretty or funny or whatever that is, but it's inappropriate for you to say that. So that they know that you know they said it and you've called out the behavior. Maintaining professional boundaries, so not having those personal conversations, not having personal conversations in areas in which inmates can hear, so that access to information. Again, think about a building with 300 people in it. How much do you know about each other? Or even your office. Most of you probably are in smaller offices with smaller groups of people. Um, do you know everything about each other? And why do you know everything about each other? Maybe because you talk to your friend in that office with your door open. And so people learn things about you. Same thing with inmates, except they have a lot of time to really study your behaviors and listen to what you're saying. Ask good questions without advocating for offenders about things that aren't related to your scope. So maybe they say to you, you know, I was sexually assaulted and, and the day after they pulled all of my property for evidence and I haven't got my property back and, um, and it's the prison staff retaliating. So pass on that information 
maybe ask that it get looked into, but without assuming that that is the case. Maybe there's a reason for that. Uh, a good example was given last week. I was in a meeting, had two sets of staff that have pretty different missions. So even within corrections, there are different missions. Um, and so one of the food service staff was saying, hey, my, my inmate is always late to work because unit staff won't wake that person up. And the unit staff said, and, and they don't have an alarm clock because they're so expensive. And the unit staff said, well, they just bought $75 of canteen but didn't buy an alarm clock. So some of this is really thinking about the choices that may have gone into. And so by having that conversation, they really learned a little bit about each other's world rather than finger pointing. Be open to receiving information about the prison environment from staff who are trained correctional professionals. So just really, if a staff member says, hey, what they just said to you was inappropriate, um, what are you gonna do to confront it? I, an okay question in that situation would be, well, what do you think I should do? What, what's the best approach for this? And take it or leave it, whatever they say. But listening to what do you think the best approaches are and maybe it's the advice I gave you today, or maybe it's a different strategy that you feel more comfortable with. Um, and then we want you to identify the behavior, prevent it, and confront it, which we've kind of talked about. That I, I'm identifying that you are trying to get personal information or get a little closer to me. I'm then going to say, hmm, you don't get to do that anymore. And so by doing that, I'm preventing future behavior because I'm saying, in the future, you don't get to talk to me like that. And I'm confronting the behavior. So what I don't want to do is pretend it never happened. I don't want to have somebody make an inappropriate comment about whatever um, and just pretend it didn't happen because then it's kind of okay to do it, right? And I might up the ante and I might continue that. Um, so then some of the contributing factors, we're looking at environment. Um, so what kind of environment is this? You learned some about uh, the culture of a prison, but the environmental factors might be peer pressure. We might have, and that might also be a social factor, but certainly the environment in a unit of 300 men, there might be some pressure if a cute girl walks in to sexually harass her in some way. Also, just the lack of women, if we're talking about a men's facility, that like maybe they haven't seen a woman that doesn't work at that facility for 10 years. Um, so does that contribute to the amount of harassment that might occur? Yeah, it absolutely does. Other environmental factors, just not being able to leave. And then again, social factors. We're looking at, I can't get stuff that I want. So if I have an inmate, some of the social factors are I want cell phones, or I want magazines, or I want whatever. I want a relationship with somebody that I haven't met before, and I want you to be my friend. And right now, you should be calling me. And I mean that, you guys. Um, but don't you want to be my friend? And if not, I might cry. Well, you all should feel significantly bad about not being my friend yet. But there's a social factor for you. Did you feel a little bit of pressure from me that like, wow, she really needs a friend? Um, lack of accountability. So we're talking about um, compromise and manipulation, but are we holding people accountable? And then we're in a high-risk environment. It's always high-risk for manipulation because of lack of access to everything that I want as an adult. So again, thinking about that walking through the yard at midnight, Something that's pretty simple to you or I is a pretty big deal potentially to um, an MA. So we want to talk about situational awareness in this context. So within the scope of compromise and manipulation. So how is interacting with an offender victim different from somebody that you would interact with in the community? So what might they want that's additional? And is there maybe need or want to compromise and manipulate different. So you might be the first person that's listened in a while or the first person that believes to them in a while. And so does that make them perhaps have feelings for you that wouldn't otherwise, maybe that wouldn't occur in the community. So thinking about that, and what am I saying to this person? Are the promises that I'm making promises that I'm going to keep? 
know that everyone is listening. They will know who you are before you walk in the door. Uh, this has always been my experience. My first day in prison, every inmate in the facility knew my entire resume. Um, so just, and that's at every prison that I've ever worked at, they knew my role. They will likely know what you do as you walk in the door. So again, thinking about that in another context for where are you interviewing people, and we'll talk more about that later, but everyone's listening to you. Maintaining your professional balance. So the reason that I continuously encourage you to form relationships with staff is because they may be your ally, your only ally on that site. So I'm guessing that advocates won't always be traveling in pairs. So if you're not in a pair and you have that staff escort, maybe they are the person that can say to you, hey, that interaction started to get a little weird or you really weren't watching your boundaries or that's too much in this setting. And I know that would be okay in the community, but it's not okay here. So looking to them for that advice. Washington Department of Corrections facilities have a zero tolerance policy around well, PREA, but then the, the compromise that we're talking about in a lot of these situations is that forming a relationship with an inmate. So we start with manipulation, then we get to a point where you're compromised and we have a pretty serious situation on our hands. And in some cases, that's going to rise to the level of custodial sexual misconduct in the second degree, which I will define for you later today. Um, but it's prosecutable and certainly something that, that we would look at. So. I'm talking about a big spectrum here because I'm saying, like, eh, they may steal your pen and then you'll go to prison, but is that a really short version of what actually does happen in a lot of these situations? Yes. So I'm looking for an end to form a relationship with you to then be inappropriate. So misconduct is really anything that you're doing that isn't great, uh, but in this, we're talking about custodial sexual misconduct in, in this forum. Um, and then anything, uh, and then compromise is maybe just receiving a letter or pictures or something from an offender, but if you don't stop it at that point, what we're saying is that ball will keep rolling. Then we're going to talk about the setting for compromise. So I have to be pretty deliberate in my actions, and, and I want to every day kind of follow the same pattern. And I said that before, and I'm glad to be saying it again, because a lot of the setting for compromise is me being off my baseline and not following, not being as rigid in my, um, in the way that I'm behaving while in a prison. So knowing your own blind spots, what are those things that are hard for you to acknowledge about your own weaknesses? So maybe... I have really low self-esteem and haven't been told that I'm pretty in a long time. Now I'm hearing it from this inmate. Every interaction that I have with them, is that a blind spot for you? Is it something that you should be thinking about? That like, wow, I'm really starved for attention and now I'm working for a men's facility where I get a lot of attention and I look forward to that. Identifying your own weaknesses. Again, maybe that's a good example of one. Maybe it's something else. Maybe you have an aunt who's in prison and have a lot of empathy around that and really put yourself in their shoes every time you're inside. The small compromise is me deliberately breaking rules, right, that I know I'm not supposed to be breaking. So if I'm not supposed to have a pen, I'm asking you for your pen. Um, that's the big deal. And so part of this is you really understanding the policies and procedures of where you're going, that in order to know that that is a, a bad step or a misstep, you have to know that pens aren't allowed in that area, and some facilities allow pens in all areas, and some don't, so really thinking about that. And then the reasons that manipulation and compromise occur, and we talked about it earlier. I mean, the real reason between behind most manipulation is the, I want to get my way. I want Chinese food, and I don't care that you want tacos. And so if I have to tell you whatever I have to tell you to get my Chinese food, I'm going to do that. And then compromise, we're taking that up one level. You know, now you've taken me to Chinese food, and I am fully in love with you, and you might be the best thing that ever happened to me. So now we should absolutely engage in a relationship. So we've seen a lot of the agency of staff in all disciplines that have been compromised. And have done things that seemed pretty outrageous to us. Um, as onlookers, that like, how could you possibly fall for this? 
And some of these folks are 30-year veteran staff with the Department of Corrections that suddenly fell in love with an inmate. Probably the worst situation, the saddest, was um, a 30-year veteran of the agency who fell in love. And so she was in her 70s and he was in his 30s and thought that that was a real relationship and that he wasn't just using her for her entire check. Um, and so really the compromise had gone to a level where that person was willing to engage in some sexual behaviors and, and do some things that um, wouldn't she wouldn't have done in her normal life. So just really thinking about um, you, you're not safe because that person wasn't and countless others that have become involved in relationships and every PREA case that involves staff involves some level of compromise on one side or the other and some level of manipulation, whether that's staff manipulating offenders or vice versa. So we want to talk about your vulnerability. Uh, and I, I, again, I think it's really important that we all do self-assessments regularly for how do people see me and how is now this new population seeing me. So for you, going into a prison, which you may not have done before, um, what are your vulnerabilities here? And so for all of us, in those times that we are in transition, so divorce, death, those things that cause us to be a little more in crisis, we are probably most vulnerable. So having more conversation with our colleagues about how we're feeling and checking in regularly. Some other stuff, so just regular stress, right? So we all know it does funny stuff to our bodies. Uh, it's certainly going to put you in a different place, and maybe that is, for me, when I'm stressed, I'm a little more snappy and a little more likely to say things that I might not stand behind on a day I'm not stressed. Being naive, so really not doing the investigation of what's going on and just accepting facts because people are telling me is certainly a vulnerability. Lack of job satisfaction. So one of the ins that I can have if I'm an inmate in uh, compromise and manipulation is to say that you hate your job or you're undervalued there, that you're not so happy or that maybe you see a relationship with an inmate suddenly as escapism or some way to escape your mundane, awful job that you hate. We hope that's not true. Um, we really hope that you love your job and are glad to be in this partnership, because we are. Um, inconsistency. Do you behave one way with some people and another way with other people? Do you sometimes behave one way? Can somebody tell your baseline, and are you willing to bend your boundaries? So if somebody can push my boundaries around, maybe they have it in with me. Uh, too much rigidity. So we see often that... Uh, staff who are eventually compromised are the ones who are most negative in their view of inmates and that they're unwilling to bend any rules. So it's one side or the other, right? So we're talking to these super rigid people or, or people who are really willing to bend their boundaries and both at some point kind of come together and have this similarity. And then what is your self-concept? So is that clear to you? Is your mission there clear to you? And are you able to stay on track with that? We really want to make sure that you're able to do that. And maybe you don't see yourself how other people see you. Ask for that feedback from your colleagues outside of the prison um, or in and, and kind of clearly define that for you, for yourself so that you are less vulnerable. So our offender warning signs, I want to tell you more about, like, how do you know? How do I know that I'm being groomed? What are the early signs of manipulation or compromise? And to start this section, I want to say to you that there is probably not a single staff that works for the Department of Corrections, and I say this, it's off the record, don't tell anybody, kidding, um, who hasn't been manipulated on some level at some point. So. If it is a small manipulation and you get, somebody gets you, they get your pen, say something. It's not the end of the world. What we don't want is for that to continue. So if it's a small interaction, and you know what? I leave there and I feel really crappy about it. And I say, like, I know they just made me bend the rules. And I tell somebody, that's a way less of a big deal than if I allow the behavior to keep going. So... We want to talk about like verbal manipulation. What are the warning signs of this? 
what's the offender saying to you? Are you confronting their inappropriate verbal interactions? So is that, and often it's really nice stuff. I get told very often that, hey, Ms. Davis, I really like your suit, or you look really cute today. Those are inappropriate interactions. So while on the street, that's like, thank you. In a prison, that is, I appreciate that, and that's not appropriate. Uh, so don't talk to me that way in the future, which feels a little crappy for some of us. But like, wow, you're trying to be nice. It just is inappropriate in this context. Um, and then to them visually, what does the way that you carry yourself say to the offender? Are you hunched over? Are you not aware of your surroundings? Do you appear to have issues with self-esteem? What can they learn from watching you? Again, this is the reason we don't have a phone, because I don't know about you, but I have pictures with my kid and other things on the phone. There's a lot of access to information about myself, but let's say you know you're going to have a waiting period between seeing two people. Are you bringing magazines? And do those magazines have your physical address on them? What are those things that I can see about you? What kind of perfume do you wear? What... What jacket are you wearing that has your the name of your, yeah, we'd all like to be a member of the Yacht Club. I'll just say Yacht Club because I don't know anybody that is. But, you know, whatever, whatever club we're all a part of, which for most of us is probably some nonprofit. But I have coats and water bottles and other things that have names of nonprofits that I'm affiliated with on them. So does that tell the offender something about my movement outside of the prison? And I would argue that it does, or, or my belief system. Um, in writing, so are they writing you letters? Have they written you something inappropriate? If so, hand it over to the folks that run the prison and make sure that you are confronting that behavior as it occurs as well, right? So years ago, I had an offender who wanted to write me a poem. Well, I said no and was called some pretty horrific names by him. Um, but it turned out he had been writing similar poems for many people that he was interacting with that were staff because they didn't see the harm in it. So really being focused on is there harm in this, and of course there is. Um, because in writing that poetry, he was saying, like, I'll write this for your spouse, and what do you like to do with your spouse? Where? I can learn a lot of information from you through that. Offenders have a lot of time on their on their hands, so a lot of time to look for weakness. So again, I'm going to argue that it's a small percentage of offenders that are really this kind of offender that are looking for to compromise and manipulate people. Um, but they're there and they're interspersed with a, a general population, and this is very much like the community. Most people have good intent. Most inmates have good intent. Some don't. So keeping your guard up, and the percentage is probably a little higher because it's a person. Um, and this is then really what they're looking for is access to outside information. So that's a commodity. Having that unmonitored information is a commodity. So whether that's just, hey, you know, I really, my, my, my sister died, and I really, I need you to make this phone call for me because I haven't talked to my family, and they think I'm dead. And in our minds, as a human being, that seems like the thing that you would do. Right? Um, it's not, and it's probably it's not an appropriate interaction in this setting. So really, not doing those favors or not making the additional phone call, or uh, we've seen all kinds of stuff. But really, that would be kind of the most solid, uh, the solid example in this situation. So some indicators of compromise. This is something that maybe your colleague goes and does advocacy at the prison that they're assigned to, and they come back and they're talking to you about their experience, and you start to see some of this in them, calling it out right then. Or maybe you're doing a self-assessment, which you should be doing after this day that you're spending or whatever amount of time, um, calling it out for yourself. Uh, because, again, we want to catch this at the beginning. It's, it's not too late at the beginning. It's, it's once you're fully compromised that somebody is in. They have an in. And um, so look for these behaviors. Spending too much time with one offender. And so are you doing more work with somebody than they actually need? Do you continue to see them uh, past when they need your services? Are you looking forward to spending time with the offender for whatever reason? So maybe that's I'm fulfilling my own personal need um, to get those compliments about my suit or whatever. Um, 
But for whatever reason, I'm looking forward to spending time with an offender. Personal discussions, so any kind of personal discussion. And again, do some thinking about how do I gain trust of somebody without disclosing a bunch of stuff about myself. Most of you are probably very well versed in not sharing a lot of personal information. Take that up a notch, though, and really think about, you know, I'm from Tacoma. That's not something that would come out in a discussion with an offender, even that broad of information. Personal versus professional interest in mind during your interaction. So are you looking for some kind of fulfillment from that offender during your interactions with them? Do you have a need for control over what they're doing? Do you deliberately plan meetings so that you can have a chunk of their time? Overconfidence, so just maybe you're sitting back at your desk right now and I want you to do a self-check. If you're listening to me and saying, this lady doesn't know crap, I want you to do a self-check because you're a little overconfident, my friend. So really, we want to make sure that we're not overconfident, that we're willing to learn, that we're willing to continue this partnership. And then really thinking about how do you manage this as an advocate, because you might not have a colleague that you trust with you. Um, and so how do you gain that trust from prison staff? And who do you turn to? Who are you talking to once you return to your office? So the stages of compromise, I've talked you through a few scenarios, but we'll kind of do this as a scenario, which is stage one is the selection of the target. So I'm looking for somebody who might not be, for whatever reason, they're off their baseline, maybe they don't have self-confidence, that's usually an easy mark for this. I'm going to test the target and say, hey, can I give you that small compliment? You look really pretty today. Oh, you didn't confront that. Now I want to find out more information about you. So I'm going to get to know you. And then I'm going to give you a, kind of the hook, which is whatever that might be. This is what, you know, you are this fabulous person. I've never met anybody like you. We could have A, B, and C if we were together and really gain your trust, make you invested. But I'm also going to have you do a series of misconduct that you would be ashamed of in front of your colleagues. So whether that's bringing me in some pictures or some kind of evidence that you've done something bad. And the thing is, wow, that's really great that you brought me whatever it was. Let's say it was a small amount of marijuana or something else. And you can even imagine that it would be something lower level, but maybe it was, you know, a small amount of marijuana. Now the thing is, hey, you brought me pot and you're working for me now, and you're going to bring me drugs, and you're going to continue to bring me drugs, and we have had staff compromise in this way over and over. And so a lot of times for that, it is having an innocent conversation with a correctional officer or whoever, and I'll use the correctional officer as an example, but please know this has happened in every discipline that works in a prison, and saying to them, hey, you're not well enough respected and you certainly don't make enough money and boy, you're smarter than all the other people here. And, and I really like, wow, you totally should, you're, you're undervalued. And, and then, you know, would you bring me a video game? And video games are clearly against policy, but eh, whatever. And then, by the way, I know where you live and I will hurt your family if you don't bring me drugs. So really thinking about that. And this starts with the lowest levels of compromise. It really is that little compliment or whatever. Um, so the impact of misconduct and compromise. So we take this very seriously as an agency, as you should. Um, it jeopardizes the facility safety. And so I ask this question a lot, but it's what would you do for love? So for those of you who are in love or who have been in love, there's a lot you would do for love, and you're kind of stupid when you're in love, and you do a lot of silly things. So if you're in love with an offender, would you bring them a gun if they wanted it? Would you bring them another weapon? So I would argue that most people would do those things. If your spouse said, I'm really in serious jeopardy, I'm scared all the time, and if only you would bring me a knife, I'd be okay. Well, now you've introduced a weapon in the facility, which jeopardizes the safety of everybody in there. So really thinking about that, what would you do for love? Um, because that's scary. So apply that to a prison context, and I'm not saying love is scary. I'm saying that love in prison is scary, um, but really being aware of that. It undermines public support. So every time we have an article that talks about a staff member 
or anybody, and honestly, probably the community response to an advocate being compromised versus even a correctional staff, the outcry would be pretty serious, right? So that now we didn't even protect you. And so that is the perception. It certainly minimizes our professionalism when these articles are published. And what we want the public to see and what you will see in coming into prisons is this really positive, pro-social, programming intensive program and not those individual relationships. And so do inappropriate relationships occur in every line of work? Absolutely. They, because this is government work, are highlighted in a different way through media. We don't want to role model bad behavior or bad boundaries. And so really important to me is that when you're coming in, you know that every interaction that the offender is having with staff is role modeling of good behavior. So if you show them poor boundaries, really you're not teaching them something that's positive for their reentry and you're not being pro-social yourself. So we're asking you in those interactions, are you role modeling? I'll tell you through interactions with female offenders, often I'm asked questions like, Miss Davis, do you think that there are men in this world? And it breaks my heart every time it happens. Are there men in this world who don't want to have sex with me or who don't want to hit me? And so my role modeling in those situations that, yes, of course, I believe that exists, and yes, of course, you should have that expectation of reliability and predictability and a partner, that's important. And so that's stuff that they can hear from you. Um, but I also role model that there's a certain way to conduct myself and that I have to have good boundaries so that you cannot get in my bubble and all of those things that also contribute to those positive relationships when they release from prison. Um, it victimizes the already vulnerable. So even let's say there, I've been compromised because I was manipulated. There's still a certain level of professional responsibility that you have for that. So this is a vulnerable population. So really holding you accountable to that professional standard that you should have set good boundaries as well. Uh, it violates the law. So there are some laws around this that I am not engaging as especially in custodial sexual misconduct, creates mistrust that's difficult to rebuild. So what are you doing when you engage in this kind of relationship? Will that color the way that I then see other staff for a long time? So if my partner that works in the prison next to me is compromised, that changes my perspective on the people that I work with. It can also create a negative bias towards people performing your role in a facility. So I will use, I don't know, let's think about a profession. I, maybe nursing is a good profession that it is very, uh, we're providing care and we're doing no harm. And in some ways similar to advocacy, right? We're, we're providing a service and doing no harm in that role. Um, prison staff have their own biases about advocates. And so a compromised advocate feeds into maybe a negative perception. So we want to make sure that we're not creating these biases and that we're saying we really understand your world and can follow the rules. So in preventing compromise, one of the best things that you can do uh, to prevent compromise is to maintain open communication. So the more that we talk to each other, the more that we are allies for each other as staff, as contractors, volunteers, we can protect each other. And having those conversations about, hey, I just saw an interaction that made me uncomfortable, or maybe you were a little too close, and being willing as the receiver of those messages to accept the feedback and not be offended by it is really important to me. So there have been times in my career that people have given me feedback about, this is my perception. Well, that's good information, and I'm not going to say that's not true or defend myself. I'm going to say thank you for sharing your perception, and I'm going to move forward after having added that feedback to whatever I'm doing. So some of the strategies for this, evaluate yourself regularly. And then ask a lot of questions. Again, really good to understand the culture that you're now becoming a part of by entering a prison, really becoming a part of the culture. Um, maintaining professional distance and only working within your role. So that's a good question as a self-check to ask regularly. Is what I'm being asked to do or look into part of my role? Is this what I'm supposed to be doing? 
monitor your own self-disclosure. And again, the simple things like, I have to drive back to Tacoma tonight. So could that happen in a conversation? Of course it could. I'm a human being, and I don't want to get stuck in traffic. But is that an appropriate thing for me to be saying to an inmate? No, it's pretty, that's an identifying piece of information. We don't want to over-personalize the work you're doing with an offender. So some of these cases might be particularly emotional for you, that like, really thinking about, and for me, often, in thinking about a case that if I was subjected to sexual violence and then had to live in that place, what would that feel like? And then really being able to take a step back and say, wow, am I over-personalizing here? And am I getting too invested? And then if you can ever say, in any role, and I think this is a good life strategy, but certainly for prison, if someone can't replace you, you're too close. And so there shouldn't be, and you're also not doing a good job mentoring the people around you, but if, if the only person that can do your very specific role is you because nobody else would understand the offender or nobody else would understand the situation, you're too close. So really monitoring that pretty closely. And then we want to take a, talk about, lastly, taking action. Um, which is, if you see something or sense that someone on your team or that you interact with is too close to saying something, and so maybe this is even a staff person as you're walking through a facility, you witness an interaction that makes you uncomfortable, say something about it. Um, if your interactions start to feel like early stage of compromise, say something. And so I, a couple of years ago, teaching and training, had a prison staff member that's been in the agency for now 25 years, say that within her first couple of years, she had an offender during her divorce that became her close friend. And he talked her into getting a P.O. box that he was going to write letters to. And so she went to do it. She got in her car, and she went to do it. And before she could get there, she turned her car around, and she went and told on herself. And she said, you know what? I think I was compromised, and I fully intended to do this, but I didn't. And that... I want to be clear that I'm not saying that's something we would accept. It's likely in this culture today something we wouldn't. But the earlier you say something, the better off you are. Because honestly, this can lead to criminal misconduct, so we want to make sure that we're catching it and that we're saying something very early on when things are still a little more in a sense. So thank you for joining me for this class. Thank you. Please stand by.